Jai Hind, very good evening and warm greetings from Minakshi Amal Dental College and Hospital, Minakshi Academy of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. On behalf of the Honorable President of Dental Council of India, Dr. Devendra Muzumdar, sir, I welcome all the participants for the 15th webinar series of DCI. DCI's initiative of conducting the webinar series in all specialities is immensely benefiting all the students, teaching faculties, clinicians, and dental professionals all over the globe. I express my sincere gratitude and thanks to our Honorable President of Dental Council of India, Dr. Muzumdar Sir, Honorable Secretary, Dr. Saha Sir, Executive Committee members, Dental Council members, and the technical team for the visionary idea and providing a common forum in these difficult times to share the knowledge and expertise in the field of dentistry. Uh, by offering the common platform, DCI webinars are bringing the entire fraternity together as a whole world come closer. Today, our fellow colleagues from all over the world are here with us participating in the webinar on the topic, non-surgical periodontal therapy. So friends, before we begin, I would like to make few announcements regarding the DCI instructions to be followed. The participants will have to register a webinar online through the link published on DCI website, www.dciindia.gov.in. Uh, complete and proper details must be furnished at the time of registration, since the same will be captured for generating e-certificates and PDE points. Participants should also note that no request for any change or modification in their details shall be considered thereafter. Hence, DCI request all the participants to kindly furnish their details accurately. E-certificates will be conferred to all the participants on their registered emails within three days of the conclusion of the webinar, provided they would have attended the entire session of the webinar uninterrupted. So please do check your spam or junk email folders as sometimes these emails do get delivered in these folders too. DCI recognizes the top five dental colleges with the highest participation in the previous webinar on the topic, retreatment strategies in prosthodontics in general dental practice. Uh, the first place goes to a St. Joseph Dental College, Iruru, Andhra Pradesh. And this is followed by Sardar Patel Postgraduate Institute of Dental and Medical Sciences, Lucknow, Saraswati Dental College, Lucknow, Vishnu Dental College, Bhimavaram, Andhra Pradesh, and Interprastha Dental College and Hospital, Ghaziabad, Uttar Pradesh. So many congratulations to all the colleges for the maximum participation. DCI also appreciate the participation of the other colleges in making the DCI webinar a grand success. Uh, today, I take a privilege to introduce the speaker of today's webinar through this platform. Dr. Gopala Krishnan, today's speaker, is an excellent academician and my good friend. He is someone who is very inspiring and every periodontist look up to him. Uh, it's an interesting uh, biodata of Dr. Gopala Krishnan. Uh, he did his uh, Bachelor of Periodontology at Raja Mutaya Dental College and Hospital, Anamalai University, Chitamran, Tamil Nadu. He has completed his PhD at Tamaset University, Thailand. Currently, he's working as a Dean, Professor and Head, Department of Periodontology at D.Y. Patil Dental College and Hospital, Pune. Uh, he has been mentored under the Global Luminary of Periodontal Plastic Surgery, Dr. P.D. Miller, and is the first life member of Indian Society of Periodontology to have an international PhD. He's a board member and Indian ambassador of the International Society of Periodontal Plastic Surgeons, USA. He was awarded a commendation from American Academy of Periodontology President, Dr. Donald Clem at 97th American Academy of Periodontology Annual Meetings at Miami, USA. He has received the Indian Professional Health Award for Excellence in Dental Innovations in Periodontology. 
He has also received an International Dental Excellence Award in Dental Research. So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Gopala Krishnan here with us on this DCI forum today. He will be speaking on the topic, non-surgical periodontal therapy. And uh, this is quite relevant in today's dental scenario. Uh, as we all know, that uh, periodontal disease is one of the most common chronic bacterial infection of supporting structures of the tooth, which is more prevalent globally and most commonly seen in the elderly people. Now, if we look into the biofilm mediated disease, it is one of the disease which is inherently very difficult to treat. So one of the greatest challenges in the treatment arises from the fact that there is no way to eliminate the bacteria from the oral cavity and the microbes will always remain located in the mouth. So hence it becomes mandatory to treat the periodontal disease in the least invasive and most cost effective manner, thereby achieving the periodontal health. This is often accomplished through the non-surgical periodontal treatment, which is phase one of the periodontal therapy. The primary goal of the non-surgical therapy is basically to control the uh, microbial infection by removing the bacterial biofilm, calculus, toxins from the periodontally involved tissues and root surfaces, especially in the areas of complex anatomy and malocclusion where <coughs> plaque removal sometimes becomes difficult. So uh, today's presentation will take you through the journey of various non-surgical treatment modalities in the field of periodontics, the recent advances, and how the non-surgical therapy can restore periodontium without the need of invasive surgical procedures. I invite Dr. Kapala Krishnan to give an insight about the various non-surgical treatment modalities in the field of periodontology. Over to you, Dr. Kapala Krishnan. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jayadeep, for your kind words. Dr. Jayadeep is a fellow alumni of mine at Annamala University, and she's also a well-known name in the periodontics. For people who do not know her, I would just like to give a brief introduction of Dr. Jayadeep. So Dr. Jayadeep is the Director of Postgraduate Studies at Meenakshi Amal Dental College and Hospital, Meenakshi University, and also a professor at periodontology She's done a postdoctoral uh, fellow from the Michigan State Universities. She did a master's and PhD from Annamala University. She's a fellow of Indian Association of Biomedical Scientists and Indian Society of Dental Research. She has many awards to her credit, amongst them to name our Research Fellowship Award, Young Achievers Award at ICDRO World Congress, Tamil Nadu Women, Young Women Scientists Award, Best Teacher Award, Best Scientific Publication Award at the International Association of Dental Research. And she has several PG students under her and PhD students. And she has got numerous publications over 130 in to name in both national and international journals. And she's a dedicated mentor and her current research activities are based on yoga practices on dental health, periodontal medicine and stem cells. Warm greetings and Navratri greetings to you all from Dr. D.Y. Patil Dental College and Hospital, Dr. D.Y. Patil Vidyapeet Pune. I'm happy to say that our college was ranked third in the National Institute Ranking Framework, MHRD, currently the Education Ministry, Government of India, in the dental category at the national level. I would like to say my gratitude, offer my gratitude to Honorable President, Dental Council of India, Dr. Dibyendu Majumdar, sir, Honorable Secretary, Dr. Savya Chasi Saha, sir, for giving me an opportunity to share this thought on this topic with you all. So this was a picture when they about the SIRS, uh, both the SIRS visit to our institute last year, inaugurating the atraumatic restorative treatment workshop by, done by a global renumerary, Dr. Pratip Pantumwanit, who's the former dean of Tamasat University Faculty of Dentistry. And we were just renewing our memorandum of understanding. Now, dear viewers all over the globe, I would like to say that I do not have any relevant financial relationship with any commercial entities in this presentation. The topic for today is non-surgical periodontal therapy. And viewers, I would like to tell that the terminology that I would be using in this presentation will be based on the World Workshop of Periodontology 1999 
AP classification. Periodontitis is defined as an inflammatory disease of supporting tissues of the teeth caused by specific microorganisms or group of specific microorganisms resulting in progressive destruction of the periodontal ligament, alveolar bone, leading to periodontal pocket formation, gingival recession, or both. There's a statement, classic statement by the American Academy of Periodontology stating that host microbial interaction influenced by various genetic and environmental factors that is of a important thing to keep in mind. What are the signs of periodontitis? You have the change in color, size, contour, and shape of gingiva, as you can see here. And you have a deepened gingival sulcus leading to periodontal pocket, gingival recession, periodontal abscess, and there's another condition called pathological migration of drift, drifting of teeth. This, if detected at an early stage and treated by non-surgical periodontal therapy, it can be reversed. Otherwise, it will lead to tooth mobility. These are the diagnostic instruments that are used. Symptoms of periodontitis. You have bleeding gums, bleeding on brushing or flossing, bad breath, painful chewing, sensitivity to, eat, uh, to the teeth, to, to hot or cold food, pus discharge from teeth or between teeth and gums, leading to loose teeth or loss of teeth. Then there are also new spaces that develop between the teeth and gums that pull away from the teeth called gingival recession. Here is a, a photograph or, or a radiograph, or a clinical photograph of a classic periodontal defect where you have an angular defect over here, uh, uh, bone loss. And you can appreciate the same in, the, in this uh, radiograph, orthopandemogram and a CBCT view, and also here an IOPA view. What are the phases of periodontal therapy? We all know that you know the first phase is the emergency phase where any dental or periodontal or any other dental emergencies are taken care of. First phase or the etiotrophic phase is the non-surgical phase that is for, uh, consists of scaling, root planing and polishing, correction of restorative and prosthetic irritant factors, antimicrobial therapy. Ladies and gentlemen to note that after every phase, you have a maintenance phase. So what do you do then? You reevaluate the, uh, I mean, response to the non-surgical phase at approximately between four to six weeks. Reevaluate the condition, and if at all you cannot avoid, then you go for the surgical phase where you go for the periodontal therapy, including implant surgeries and endodontic therapy. Then again you reevaluate the patient. Then you give the final restoration, evaluation of response to the restorative procedures. And then the maintenance phase for a period of time, every period of time of about two to three months, you just take a feedback about the status of the oral health of the patient. So as I said, in the initial therapy, what are the things that are important? It may sound very simple, viewers, but it is very important. It is very, very, very important to chart or make a record of the periodontal indices. How many of you, do, how, how many of us do in this practice? It's a question we should ask ourselves. This is a tool for you to assess the status of the, sorry. So, so then you go for the plug control instructions. Then you have the toothbrush and interdental cleansing, uh, cleaning advice, smoking cessation counseling, professional cleaning. Then you arrange for extractions of teeth with hopeless prognosis and you monitor response to initial therapy, repeat the indices. Are the pocket depths when you uh, reevaluate it is greater than four millimeter with bleeding on probing? If it is yes, then you go for the corrective therapy. As we spoke before, if it is no, then you go for the supportive therapy. Phase one therapy, etiotropic phase or cost related therapy, it is a very, very important phase in the treatment of any gingival or periodontal disease. What are the rationale and goals of NSPT? Gingivitis usually precedes periodontitis. However, all, not all gingivitis progresses to periodontitis. The main goal of NSPT is to diagnose and treat the disease at the gingivitis stage so that it does not progress to the periodontitis stage. That's what we want. And la ladies and gentlemen, just see over here. This is a classic case, you know, when the patient came to the uh, uh, clinic initially before scaling and root planing and see the condition after scaling and root planing after three weeks. Isn't it nice? 
What are the components of NSPT? You have three important factors, the patient-related factors, the dentist or periodontist-related factors, and adjunctive factors. Patient-related factors, you have the motivation therapy, behavioral modifications, chemical plug control, mechanical plug control. Motivational therapy, this I would like to just go back and remind you in the previous presentation by, by, by my senior colleague, Dr. TV Padmanabhan, who said that motivation and home care is very important, and I am re-emphasizing that. So there was a systematic review which was done that you know they used motivational interview, interviewing to the patients. So the more you develop the motivation amongst the patients to maintain their oral hygiene, the more better tissue response or their uh, treatment outcome you will anticipate. What are the behavioral factors that you need to know? Oral hygiene behavior, you need to note of that. Then you also should make a note of the dietary modifications of the patient, smoking, parafunctional habits, and stress. Let us go one by one. Dietary modifications, suggestions from the 2011 European Workshop for Periodontology. These are the foods that are recommended. Increased levels of fish oils, fiber, fruit, and vegetables. Reduce the levels of refined sugars. And foods that are rich in vegetables, broccoli, spinach, berries, any kind of berries, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, red beans. And for some people who want to wine, once in a while, red wine and dark chocolate with greater than 70% cocoa. They're all rich in key antioxidant micronutrients. The other, other way, they include the diet that includes the nut, olive, and fish oil. So the components of macro and micronutrients are important. Then smoking. I would like to say that smoking does not alone cause periodontal disease, but the smoking, it accelerates the existing gingival disease into a much dangerous level. So what are the proposed mechanism for the negative effects of smoking on periodont uh, periodontium? You have vascular alterations, altered neutro neutrophil function, decreased IgG production. So in the end, what it does, it destroys the defense mechanism. In the end, you have a difficulty in eliminating the disease by mechanical therapy. Here are two classic studies, which I want to say with you all that how motivational therapy helped in uh, the patients cutting back on the habit totally altogether, or at least cutting back on the number of cigarettes. So in 2014, there's a classic article, article I mean, uh, published in the Journal of Periodontology by Dr. P.D. Miller et al. He developed an evidence-based scoring index for determining the periodontal prognosis of the diseased molars. So uh, factors, age, tooth type, probing depth, uh, focation, mobility, smoking, and diabetes were the factors that were evaluated. Amongst them, smoking was found to be the most significant factor. Again, this was a retrospective study. Again, a prospective study was done that was a part of my PhD topic. So we evaluated the same parameters over a period of two years. And then we saw that, again, the smoking is a significant factor, but with motivation, with motivation to the patient, 88% of the people cut back on smoking and their status was, I mean, 88% uh, gave up smoking and 12% cut back. That is a significant uh, improvement. And then we saw the disease kind of not progressing. Now, what are the parafunctional habits? We all know bruxism is there, clenching is there, mouth breathing and tongue thrusting. Bruxism, you know, it's an involuntary habitual response where you grind the teeth while sleeping and uh, clenching is due to anxiety, you grind the teeth, and then you have another condition called abfraction. They are also the cervical notches, I mean the notches that are found on the cervical surfaces of the tooth, that is due to occlusal loading. Then you have the mouth breathing, tongue thrusting. Parafunctional habits are a potential source for trauma from occlusion, but then unless you diagnose and manage this using psychological intervention, habit breaking appliances, pharmacotherapy and counseling mean you will not be able to succeed. So it must be a part of NSPT. Stress. Now let's go about stress. What is the simplest mechanism that how you can see that, I mean, stress plays a role in the periodontal disease, okay? So you go, patients have a psychological stress, so their attitude changes. So they'll think, why should I brush my teeth? So why should I maintain then? They also have a habit of smoking a few cigarettes. And then due to this, they tend to overeat, 
and because of poor oral hygiene and poor compliance there's bacterial infection and then serum cortisols are produced which all uh, combines together leading to the periodontal disease so this should be taken care by appropriate counseling now what are the periodontic centric factors you have the hand versus power driven instrumentation then you have the full mouth disinfection protocol versus quadrant wise uh, scaling and root planing root planing versus root surface debridement subgingival irrigation with various uh, substances chlorhexidine povidone versus ultrasonic instrumentation there are many studies which tell which is better over this or that one thing when you go I mean whatever the uh, whatever the treatment modality you may use whether it is hand or scaling it depends on the efficiency of the operator how successful you will be in eliminating the uh, local factors and ladies and gentlemen to know that it is the hard deposits on the tooth or root surface that are more important to be removed than the uh, disease soft tissue that doesn't mean you remove remove the you don't remove that because this serves as a nidus for forming more bacteria clusters so these are all the instruments that you use for the hand uh, uh, hand instrumentation this is the ultrasonics now this is the classic protocol by dr kurenen et al in 1995 the full mouth disinfection protocol how do you go about this the first stage you do scaling and root planing all the teeth in two visits within 24 hours under local anesthesia as what he says but i would say if you can avoid local anesthesia avoid that and one more thing uh, viewers scaling and root planing is not complete unless you polish the tooth surface very important to note it is simple but yet important then brushing the back of the tongue for one minute with 1% chlorhexidine gel then you use mouthwash two times for two uh, two times for one minute with 10 ml of 10 seconds to reach the tonsils to get the desired effect subgingival irrigation of all the pockets three times for 10 minutes with 1% chlorhexidine gel and after every two sessions repeated at day 8 using 8 and 6 mm label syringe so this is all with the professional uh, cleaning now you go to the uh, home control that is you have to motivate so again you do the chlorhexidine rinsing and then give the proper oral hygiene instructions written row oral hygiene instructions to the patients and whatever respective languages they understand with all these instructions so you see the full mouth scaling and uh, uh, root planing this is under la quirinal then brushing the tongue with the 1% chlorhexidine gel then rinsing so that you know it goes it uh, I mean last 10% it reaches the tonsil and then reinforcement with the home care subgingival irrigation and can you just see how the tooth looks how it was when the patient came to the clinic before the treatment and how it is neat and clean after the treatment now there is another question that in subgingival irrigation i mean is chlorhexidine more effective or povidone iodine more effective this again i would like to go by science all are effective amongst these two amongst these two but in the current scenario with uh, the covid pandemic and times we would say that go for povidone iodine uh, uh, goggles because it has got an antibacterial antifungal antiviral and also it is active against the bacterial spores home care oral hygiene maintenance you have the mechanical plug control and the chemical plug control and what is the right brushing technique modified bass method this is a right uh, uh, brushing technique that you use wherein you keep the brush with a uh, at a 45 degree angulation to a set of three teeth with the bristles just touching the gingiva and then you give circular motions for 10 seconds and after that you give a motion in the 45 degree angulation from the tip of the gingiva to the incisal surface so this is a modified bass method that has been followed and you have a soft medium and hard toothbrush so it's always recommended to use a soft toothbrush and these are various types you can see over here flat zigzag wooden extra soft color coded removable and charcoal activated this is the current one which is being recommended and which is used now again you will have a question do you need to use a electrical toothbrush or you need to use a manual toothbrush so if you see over here i mean we'll see the merit demerits of the each 
So how is the electric toothbrush superior? It is great for people with arthritis or other conditions that lead to limited dexterity. It's popular with kids who think that electric brushes are more fun to use, that it comes with variable speeds to help reduce uh, pressure on sensitive teeth and gums. The timers ensure that you brush each section of your mouth for the right amount of time, but the head needs to be changed every three months. Now let us see in the manual, it helps the people to feel that they have more control while brushing it has great, it, uh, you can control the pressure what you apply, whereas that is a demerit with the thing of the electric brush. Most of the brushes now, they come with variable pressure. Then you have, they are small and it's easy to pack while traveling. It is cheaper and easier to replace and brush again needs to be replaced every three months. Now, dentifrices, what are all the different dentifrices available? And again, ladies and gentlemen, viewers, I'm not here to just say about a particular brand or anything. I'm just telling going by the science. So you have for the anti caries protection toothpaste, the composition is sodium fluoride and sodium monofluorophosphate. It cons consists of fluoride that helps in tooth enamel decalcification, decal protect the teeth from tooth decay and cari I mean cavities. And flock and gingivitis prevention toothpaste, you have the component sodium laurel sulfate, triclosan and zinc sanus anions. It has got an antibacterial activity and prevents the formation of dental plaque. How it does that, it breaks that Calculus, uh, it breaks the calculus and breaks down the calculus of the deposits. So you can see that in Crest to Colgate total also there. Then there are several uh, marketing advertisements for tooth whitening toothpaste. It contains papain, dimethicone. It also contains a substance called pumis. Pumis we all know. They do not say that, but more or less they have pumis. But pumis is a abrasive that tends to erode the surface of the enamel. And once the enamel is gone, it can't be retrieved. Now, desensitizing toothpaste, it has got the component potassium nitrate that decreases the fluid flow through the tubules by clogging them. And it decreases the level of activity of dental sensory nerves and prevents or reduces the sensation signals from reaching the brain. So it forms a layer and secondary, it helps in the formation of secondary dentine and that's how it uh, helps in the uh, sensitive teeth. Now, what are the interdental aids in the periodontal therapy? You have the dental tapes, water pick, and the dental floss. Then you need to know about the different types of embrasures. Embrasures are the spaces that are between the uh, proximal contact of the teeth and the gingiva. So what do we do for each type of embrasure? So in type one embrasure, they are completely occupied by healthy interdental papilla. They are floss used only for cleaning the sulcus. About 75% of embrasure is occupied by gingiva. In type 2 embrasure, you use medium or coarse and thick dental floss. In type 3, you have about 50% of the embrasure occupied by the gingiva. And the fine pointed small spiral interdental brushes are uh, recommended for that. And about 25% of embrasure is occupied by gingiva. In type 4, you need thick spiral interdental brushes and fine bristle ended unit after brush. When there is a complete loss of interdental papilla, bristle had ended unit after brushes and thick spiral interdental brush is seen. You can see this all in these pictures. So this is the interdental brushes. There is a floss called super floss that you use and treat, I mean, that you use to, that is used for maintaining the post implant for any, to avoid any peri-implant problems, you use the floss called super floss. Then how do you use the floss? Wrap the floss around your finger, then pinch the floss around your thumb and index finger, leaving one to two inches in between, then work up the floss up and down in between the teeth and using the index finger. Use the thumb then guide to put, as I said, uh, push the floss back and forth around the tooth. Flossing, this is called as water pick. So you floss with water, there's a water jet over here. So it is now available in the markets. Then gingival physiotherapy. This is a very important thing that you all need to know. That is a gingival massage a must? Yes, it is. It is from nine, right from 1948 until today. What does it do? It increases the uh, blood flow, oxygen level, and also it helps in the catenization of gingiva. So main important thing, it improves the blood flow. Chemical plaque control. So we have varieties of antimicrobial agents, dentifrices, and mouthwash. You have the class. I'll just go by the class. Bis biguanate, fluoroxidine, enzymes, essential uh, oil extracts, 
metal salts, quaternary ammonium compounds, phenols, and natural molecules surfactants. So how do you use chlorhexidine? You take 10 ml of 0.2 chlorhexidine in one is to one dilution with water. Frequency twice daily oral rinsing for 30 seconds in the morning and evening after 30 minutes of toothbrushing. Important instruction is do not rinse with water or any other mouthwash or brush the teeth or immediately eat after using the mouthwash for at least half an hour, 30 minutes. So these are the mouthwash, bisbiguanides, essential oils, cetylberinum chloride, and you have um, uh, the Ayurvedic mouth rinse also. Now adjunctive chemotherapeutics in NSPT, you have the systemic antimicrobials, local drug delivery, probiotics, and the antioxidants. Let us go to see all of them one by one. Systemic antimicrobials. So periodontal in this infection is the main goal of non-surgical non periodontal therapy. The rationale for use of adjunctive systemic antimicrobials is to reduce the bacterial load, thereby helping in resolution of the inflammation and, I mean, and uh, controlling the disease. Why the remnant bacteria may be due to the uh, bacterial load, it may be due to, to the complex nature of the plaque biofilm. When there is limitation of uh, scaling, root planing to remove the infection from inaccessible areas like deep pockets, forcation, and spiral pockets, invasive nature of periodontal path uh, pathogenic bacteria like A and P gingivalis, and recolonization of bacteria in treated periodontal sites. Indications of systemic antimicrobials. This is a condition is called acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis before. Now it is called as necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, wherein the lesion, you know, you can see here, it appears as a non-specific acute inflammatory process with a rapid onset, and there is pain, ulceration, and necrosis of the interdental papilla with a slough, a punched out crater ulcer-like uh, uh, appearance. In this cases, there is bleeding, spontaneous bleeding on gentle manipulation, and there is usually accompanied by foul order, bad metallic taste, increased salivation, and regional lymphadenopathy. Abscesses of the periodontium, you can see the periodontal abscess where this is pre-op, and after squaling root planing with systemic antibiotics followed by label composite splint, you can see the effect after a month after the treatment. Isn't it nice? Then you have the generalized severe chronic periodontitis. This is a condition where you can see the destruction in the CBCT picture. You can see the destruction of the bone, how severe it is affected. Aggressive periodontitis. It was formerly called as local, uh, localized juvenile periodontitis. When this condition, you can see the classic feature is uh, angular bone loss or arc-shaped bone, bone loss around the molars. So you can see this over here. And you can appreciate this in the CBCT picture, the arc shape form of, it is in the shape, the bone loss is in the shape of an arc, arc form. Gingival enlargement cases, inflammatory and drug induced, phenantoin, amylodipine for treating seizures and hypertension. I would like to say ladies and gentlemen that using these drugs alone do not cause gingival enlargement. Additional local factors, in, I mean, having ginger, I mean, gingival inflammation plus the use of this drug for a long, these drugs for a long time, exacerbates the condition, and then you get the desired uh, form, how it is showing up here. So this again, amylodipine uh, induced uh, gingival enlargement. Then the European Federation of Periodontology consensus of adjunctive antibiotics. So is it a time to for a rethink on the use of antibiotics to treat periodontal disease? There is pros and cons for everything. There's increased there's a non-surgical treatment phase that reduce and the need and extent of surgery. Okay, what are the cons? Broad spectrum antibiotics should be a weapon of last resort. I repeat, it should be a weapon of last resort to be used in extreme cases only, meaning that you don't take a gun to shoot an ant. So that is what you need to know about this. Then what are all the uh, antibiotics that are used are administered in non-surgical periodontal therapy? These are the microorganisms, as I said before, P. gingivalis, T. denticola, and T. forsythia. The first line empirical uh, treatment of antibiotics of choice is amoxicillin 500 plus metronidazole 400 milligrams, azithromycin, doxycycline, Second line you have is ciprofloxacin, uh, azithromycin 500 milligrams, doxycycline 100 to 200 milligrams, 
Ciprofloxacin 500 milligrams for a standard dosage, 600 milligrams. Clarithromycin 250 to 500 milligrams, and tetracycline 250 milligrams. Then in local drug delivery, based on application, there are three important aspects that we need to know. You have the personally applied, which you can use at home and professionally. Applied. So home irrigation, as we said, traditional jet pipes then water pigs, soft cone, rubber uh, uh, tips. Whereas professionally uh, applied, you have the uh, non-sustained subgingival uh, drug delivery and sustained subgingival drug delivery, hollow fibers, control release uh, devices, dialysis tubing, strips and films. What are the important aspects of LDD? You have three things that need, you need to note. Adequate concentration. It gives adequate concentration to the site and direct site of action and sustained activity for a desired time, and also it resolves or resolves. So the most important notion for LDT is to contract the problems of antimicrobial resistance that are commonly faced by the systematic systemic therapy, and also there will be a better patient compliance. Now let us go to the next. Uh, what we are going to see is about the host modulation therapy, HMT. So if there is bacteria with all these complexes, which we all know, red, orange, and green, these are all the, uh, these are all the protocol that we follow. SRP polishing, mechanical plug control, chemical plug control, systemic antibiotics, and local drug to review. Now, for host mediators with cytokines, prostaglandins, and MMPs, what do we do? Antiprotein is you have the blocking of excessive production of MMPs. Then number two, you have blocking the arachidonic acid metabolites using the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Then you have the lipoxins and resolvents, then regulation of metabolism, bisphosphonate, and you have the immune modulation therapy, pro-inflammatory cytokine inhibition. To date, this one approved systemic therapy fire and treatment of periodontal disease, and that is a subjunctive sub uh, it is the sub-antimicrobial dose doxycycline, which is in the trade name Periostat. It now regulates the activity of MMPs. Research is focused on using anti-cytokine therapy so for pro-resolving pro molecules as HMT periodontitis. Moreover, the commercialization of many HMT options like bisphosphonate, NSIDs, and statins are currently pending some of the NSIDs due to risk and benefits associated with these drugs. Next, the probiotics. How do the probiotics as, act as a role in NSPT? So you have the direct interaction between the probiotics and the oral my, biofilm and microfolia. So you have the direct interactions in dental plaque, involvement in binding of the oral microorganisms to the proteins, action on the plaque formation, then it produces chemicals that inhibit the oral bacteria. This is the direct interaction. Indirectly, how does it go? It modulates the systemic immune response it acts on the it, uh, local immunity, it affects the local immunity. Selection pressure on developing oral microfolia towards colonization by less pathogen species. What are the commercially available probiotics for periodontal uh, disease prevention and management? Gum periobalance, peribiotic, bifi dumb bacterium aquilact, wakamate D, prodentis, but the naturally available probiotic is yogurt or curd, what is recommended. These are all the medications. They are yet to come to our nation, but natural is the best. Now, antioxidants. Let us see the role of antioxidants, the source and the clinical significance. You have the beta carotene. So you, the source is the green, orange, yellow vegetables, fruits, and it causes the, I mean, it helps in the controlling the, Periodontal breakdown, alpha tocopherol, you have the wheat, plant oil, green leafy vegetables. So it has got a prostaglandin in inhibiting effect so that it will reduce the periodontal inflammation. Ascorbic acid, we all know. Where do you get citrus fruits, cruciferous vegetables? So wherever there is a gingival bleeding and I mean, it's a, it's a deficiency of vitamin C, we give this. And minerals, you have zinc, magnesium, so source is legume, nuts, green vegetables again. They have cytotoxic reaction. Curcumoids, turmeric, it is helping, helped in wound healing, whether it's antibacterial, fung fungicidal. Then you have the other ones, epigalactose galate. You can see that in green tea. It reduces the risk of caries and plaque formation. 
spirulina fusiforms, blue green microalgae, effective in buccal squamous cell carcinoma, eugenol, you so find it in clove. In a regular clove, you can see it. What does it help in toothache, controlling toothache? Now, adjunctive biotherapeutics in NSPT, we have the lasers, we have the photodynamic therapy, we have the ozone therapy, and we have the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So lasers, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. There are several types of lasers that we use in the treatment of peri uh, periodontal peri-implant disease. The diode lasers, NDAC lasers, RBM AC lasers, RBM chromium, uh, yttrium, scandium gallium garnet lasers, and the CO2 lasers. So in the NSPT, the laser therapy is advocated for sulcular debridement, but it is also known as soft tissue curettage. And bactericidal, and it also gives bactericidal effects by doing this in the periodontal pockets. It is also known as uh, laser pocket disinfection. There is also another thing, low level laser therapy that helps as a, it's a great, it is, uh, has a photosynthesizing effect and it, it is very useful in NSPT. RBM laser is the non-surgical periodontal therapy, which is valuable and in combination with mechanical debridement, the results are better with significant gains in clinical attachment level. It is an excellent alternative to control proliferation of microorganisms. Photodynamic therapy, it has three components, the light, the oxygen-free radicals, photosensitizer. What happens when the, photo, for, when the photosensitizer is stimulated by an appropriate light of a wavelength that provides free radicals to the, I mean, of oxygen that cause tissue damage to the infected area? So the, the cytotoxic products, they have a short uh, half-life and a limited radius effect. So in other words, they are only limited to the infected area where the photosensitizer is accumulated. So thus, PDT, photodynamic therapy, is a topical method that does not affect other host tissues. Then what are the goals of ozone therapy? Elimination of pathogens, restoration of proper oxygen metabolism, induction of a friendly ecologic environment, increased circulation, immune activation, stimulation of the humoral antioxidant system. Routes of ozone administration. You have the gaseous ozone, ozonated water, ozonated oil. So commercially available, heal ozone by CAVO, Ozetron by MAMED, product photo prozone by WNH. This is how you prepare the ozonated water. And here you can see a picture of ozone gas application that we have uh, at our uh, institute. Now next, orthodontic therapy. How does orthodontic therapy help as an adjunct to periodontal therapy. So this is another thing that we are going to see a few cases. Factors that are seen as benefits for orthodontic treatment of patients with periodontal disease. Here you can see a picture, alignment of crowded anterior teeth that improve access to all tooth surfaces during the oral hygiene, which is a greatest advantage. So it is easy for the patient to comply when it is being treated. You can see the free photo with a class three mole occlusion and once it's corrected, see how beautiful it is and it shows improvement in the gum condition. So it is very easy for the patient to maintain and uh, thanks to the orthodontist for the wonderful job. I mean, it is all interdisciplinary. And again, you have the correction of trauma from occlusion for the deep, uh, in deep bite. So you can see the deep bite over here and once it's corrected, you can see the outcome, how it has helped. So, this has avoided the uh, condition to go in for a surgical, I mean, uh, surgical intervention. Tooth uprighting, which may correct certain bony disc, uh, defects. Sorry, sorry. And often roots out the need for osteotomy. So you can see the picture over here before and after therapy. So it was used to correct biotype. Uh, uh, case with orthodontics by just by using the top force alone. So you, you have to see over here the tooth or teeth with uh, fracture, perforation, subgingival intraosseous uh, caries that may be treated with adequate restorations or prosthesis after forced eruption that may even improve the resistance and retention. So you also eliminate the open embrasures and you have the aesthetic improvement of coronal positioning before restoration. Trauma from occlusion. Coronoplasty, you can see a treated case, as I said before, how trauma was corrected. This was corrected by the patient's age was 56 years. Now, what is coronoplasty? After correction, coronoplasty is the elimination of the occlusal supracontacts 
that may be present during functional movements and it is a selective reduction of occlusal areas to establish a functional relationship favorable to the periodontium by reshaping the teeth very important to note it is the selective uh, reduction of the occlusal areas to establish functional relationship please note that word splinting splinting of mobile teeth what is a splint a splint is an appliance that is used for maintaining or stabilizing mobile teeth in their functional position what are the indications it restores it restores and improves the patient's masticatory function and comfort they stabilize the teeth that have increased mobility that facilitate periodontal instrumentation and occlusal adjustment of ex extremely mobile teeth it prevents tipping or drifting of teeth and extrusion of unopposed teeth stabilizes the it stabilizes the teeth when indicated following orthodontic treatment it creates adequate occlusal stability while replacing the missing teeth and stabilize the teeth following an acute trauma so this is the uh, benefits of splinting so you can see here cast bonded custom made splint which was used in the past nowadays we use the composite splint and fiber reinforced composite resin splint effect of nspt on systemic conditions causal or casual effect do systemic conditions predispose the subject to periodontitis the, if you want to know the answer the answer is yes chronic periodontitis uh, do does it have a relationship with atherosclerotic and cardiovascular disease yes my the moderator for today's session she has done her phd work on this uh, relationship between uh, per, I mean periodontal disease and cardiovascular disease and you have diabetes adverse pregnancy outcome respiratory disease chronic kidney disease rheumatoid arthritis cognitive impairment obesity metabolic syndrome and cancer does periodontal therapy reduce the risk for systemic disease yes now non surgical versus surgical therapy so here is a systematic review of the effect of surgical debridement versus the non surgical debridement for the treatment of chronic periodontitis ladies and gentlemen to note each of the statement in different colors if you are going to treat sites with where they have a probing pocket depth where it is only 1 to 3 mm with open flap debridement it was found that there was a significantly more clinical attachment loss than with scaling and root planing alone it was also further to add on when sites with probing depth 4 to 6 mm were treated with open flap debridement there was again significantly less clinical attachment gain than with the scaling and root planing procedure but when sites with probing pocket tap greater than 6 mm were treated with open flap debridement there was significantly more clinical attachment gain than with scaling and polishing so ladies and gentlemen it is wise to use the appropriate treatment appropriate you diagnose so again i said you know in the past you don't take an ant to shoot a gun so you will be i mean you don't take the gun to shoot an ant so you know you know what the i mean over here if you're going to attempt you're going to see all this so wherever it's possible you use the nspt that is the treatment uh, which is most indicated and for the pockets below 6 mm pockets above 6 mm you can when there is no option then go for surgery why can't all the cases be restricted to gingival this wouldn't it be lovely see how these conditions are how lovely it would be if the case is this that is all in our hands first is except mean first apart from the first step is to motivate the patients good professional care we motivate the patient for home care home care again i want to put it on your minds that you know it is a thing which is very important you know it is a team work then only you get the expected outcome what are the limitations of nspt it is a treatment of choice in gingivitis cases treatment of chronic choice in mild to chronic periodontitis moderate uh, chronic periodontitis patients severe periodontitis cases where the ppd is greater than 6 mm gingival enlargement cases induced aggressive periodontitis cases or refractory periodontitis unfortunately you will have to go for surgical therapy but you know even in cases you know it is in our hands you know i mean that the condition does not go to this condition of severe periodontitis and also in the patient's hand and gingival enlargement if it is noticed in an early stage we can nip it in the bud stage with aggressive and refractory i mean I mean that are the limitations 
But then still NSPT is still the gold standard. As I said before in the opening state, gingivitis usually precedes periodontitis. However, it is important to know that not all gingivitis progresses to periodontitis. When gingivitis is left undiagnosed and untreated, it advances to periodontitis. So it is in our hands, viewers, ladies, gentlemen, to see, uh, I mean, to motivate and see what we want to treat. It is always better to be conservative rather to be explorative. What, is the, what are the take home messages? Okay, and the gold standard periodontal therapy. First, the, there should be a proper motivation and awareness about the periodontal disease that should be uh, given to the patients and the public. Then the next step is well executed non surgical periodontal therapy. Then motivate the patient so that he performs very good block control of the highest level. Later, you planned properly to give a supportive periodontal therapy. Recall visits is very important. Only when all these four components are taken care, then we've done our job well together. With this, I close down my presentation or come to an end of my presentation. In this COVID pandemic, I have a prayer for all this, uh, the entire globe. I want to end this with a prayer. Uh, it is taken from the Upanishads. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha. May all be happy. Sarve Santu Niramaya. May all be free from illness. Sarve Badrani Pashyantu. May all witness auspiciousness everywhere. Ma Kaschit Duk Bhagat Bhavet. May no one suffer. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. May peace be with all. Dr. Jaydeep. Yes, thank you, Dr. Koparakrishan, for an excellent presentation. Um, you have very well explained about the various non-surgical treatment modalities, emphasizing uh, the role of uh, simple mechanical plaque control measures, such as toothbrushing, chemical plaque control, the importance of gingival physiotherapy, and interdental cleansing aids. Uh, the importance of local drug delivery, probiotics, ozone therapy, lasers, and photodynamic therapy was also uh, wonderfully explained as a part of non-surgical treatment procedures. And uh, especially in the case of medically compromised patients, where sometimes the surgical procedures becomes difficult to, con uh, to conduct. So uh, now it's a time for question answer session. And uh, you would be happy to know, Dr. Gopalakrishnan, that we have received about 185 questions, uh, queries from our participants. I thank all the participants for posting their queries. And, uh, but I think due to constraint of time, it won't be possible for us to ask all the questions on this forum, obviously. But I request you to take a few questions uh, from the participants. So uh, the first, first question is, like uh, when the uh, calculus is generalized present all over the oral cavity, is it must that bleeding on probing should be there? I mean, can you please repeat? I did not get the, I, I couldn't hear yeah. it properly. In case, the, uh, in case there is a generalized presence of calculus all over the oral cavity, is it must that bleeding on probing will be there? Definitely it will be there. Definitely it will be there. Definitely it will be there. Because mm -hmm. I mean the stages of gingivitis, then leading to periodontitis, the clinical signs, it is, it is there. Definitely if there is full calculus all over the mouth, there will be definitely uh, bleeding, uh, bleeding on probing. Yeah. In fact, there may be okay. even spontaneous, uh, you know, you don't even have to probe. There may be spontaneous, even on touch, you may have bleeding. On, you'll, you'll, you'll have spontaneous bleeding. Also provided that the uh, gingival infection should also be in an active stage. Yes. So definitely you would have bleeding on probing in that case. Yes. Uh, so the next question is that uh, why it is suggested that one should not smoke after tooth extraction? <laughs> Very interesting uh, question. I've been asked this question by a patient like uh, viewers. Uh, I'd like to say that this was... Uh, 
way back, 10 years back, it was a diplomat, which was I treated. And I did a full mouth uh, uh, flap surgery. Yeah. So when I was back in Delhi that time, and immediately after that, I said, sir, hey, doctor, I have this meeting to go. Can I have some smoke and alcohol? I said, absolute no. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, if you've seen, I mean, ladies, if you see that smoking slide, uh, uh, I just said that, you know, how important it is, what it will do. I mean, uh, you mean, I mean, what are the chances that, you know, I mean, if you do not have your, if you have the local factors are there, if there's no proper maintenance, how it breaks down the periodontal tissue totally. So that is there. So it is a big no. Mm -hmm. So they can, if they really want to, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not here to recommend one to smoke or not to smoke, but as a dentist and what I do for the patients, I would say it's an absolute no. And I will, in fact, tell the, I mean, in fact, tell that you address the patient to do, uh, I mean, uh, stop smoking, smoking cessation totally, and I'll counsel the patient accordingly. Definitely, absolutely correct. Um, there's another. I would say I would say one thing. There are you know a similar ch chewing gums. You know, I mean, which has a nicotine, uh, uh, which has a nicotine added to it. Okay, you have the zybar. That is one uh, uh, chewing gum. So after maybe after uh, I mean thirty, that is a, actually a thing that has been uh, used to stop the patients from the habit of smoking. It has very low percentage of nicotine, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the patient can chew that and feel good and over a period of time he'll have a dislike for the state i mean for the taste and then stop the smoking altogether so that's perfect now uh, there's another one question which has been asked by many participants like uh, if the person is suffering from severe bone loss what can i do as a journal dentist first i would say is uh, i mean uh, we have to see how much the extent of the bone loss is. As I said in the presentation, severe bone loss. If you go for a very severe bone loss, I mean, if I would say there is at least, um, you can even push it up, up to 60%, 50 to 50 to 55% of this bone loss. Still, I could say, and if there is no, uh, and, and if there is uh, no mobility, wherever there is, it has to go for a surgery. After, of course, after the scaling and root planing, after scaling and root planing, ideally, after three months, the patient should come back for a reevaluation, and then ideally, ideally, and then they have the. I mean, if you want to, ideally, if you are planning for a surgery, you should plan, plan it after three months. But they can come for recall visits within six weeks. You reevaluate the condition. If there's improvement, fine. There is a thing in uh, the West which they are very. Uh, I would like to tell this to the viewers. It's very important information. So I mean, there is a thing called non-surgical bone grafting. Mm. So without opening the, without opening the, and this again was, you know, I mean, uh, started by my mentor, Dr. P.D. Miller. So wherein you push in the calcium, uh, I mean, calcium phosphate bone graft uh, particles into where there is an angular bone loss or defects and try to treat without opening the case. The, the main intent is the more the less you use the knife, the much more better. And if you have to use the knife, you have to use the knife, but you have to go in sequence, phase one, phase two, phase one, phase two, and phase, I mean, phase two, before that, I would try to say avoid it. If it's absolutely necessary, then go for the phase two. Yes, but then uh, this is how you treat. So it's yeah. an important information you all need to know. There's an option called non-surgical bone grafting. Oh, that's wonderful. Because uh, I think once you expose the bone, it might undergo necrosis also. So yes, yes, it's a yes. very conservative treatment of yes. uh, the regenerative uh, periodontal procedures. Now, there's another question which has been asked by uh, many of the viewers that uh, during this pandemic situation, is it safe to use scaling? Is it safe to, uh, safe to you do scaling? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's a, a good question, very good question. If you are following, see, if you see, there is a classic article by Dr. Purnima Kumar and Kumar Subramaniam, I mean, published in Journal of Periodontology, if you see the literature, there is no evidence which states till now that aerosols are harmful because there has to be a study which has to be done on COVID patients and then taken and done. But 
there are some initial uh, by this dr stephen harrell he has done initial few work on uh, few patients but then there is no significance so if you take the appropriate level 3 uh, precautions as per the covid protocols that is being prescribed by the uh, level 2 and level 3 if you take the appropriate uh, i mean uh, what do you mean to say appropriate instructions and you follow them meticulously there is no harm if you go for ultrasonic scaling but then i mean i would suggest that you all the all of you follow the protocol and do not try to you know take on the uh, take on any chance and it's a must that when a patient walks to your office and if there is an intervention which is need to be done it is always better to get an rt pcr test done and then you are more safe and if even if there is rt pcr if the patient is negative still you go because you never know where the bug is exactly exactly and we have to take a lot of uh, precautions as a dentist point of view yes you know that is also <clears throat> the current scenario and uh, the last question i would like to you know uh, stress upon that uh, many viewers have asked this question that uh, for a healthy individual which toothbrush uh, which toothbrush is better whether it is soft medium or hard most asked question of this webinar <laughs> it is soft yes and you have the i said no if you see in the presentation you can see this in the recording yes. uh, which will be put up on the dci website charcoal mm -hmm. soft uh, bristles they are the in thing of today why i'll tell you because <laughs> if you mean because you do not want to use a harder bristle that in a normal it's a healthy it's a healthy patient in a normal mm -hmm. condition where you can you know even wear off the tooth mean wear off if there is a forceful brushing and they don't use the proper brushing technique there are chances for recession gingival recession and there are also chances for you know even uh, abrading i mean there will be abra abrasion of the tooth uh, tooth structure so why do we need that mm -hmm. let us keep it simple soft is the answer so, so uh, i think that's all for the question answer session Uh, I thank you, Dr. Kapal, for answering all the queries by the uh, participants. At the uh, at the outset, I would like to once again acknowledge and give my thanks to Honorable President, Dental Council of India, Dr. Dibendu Majumdar Sir, Secretary, Dr. Sobhya Shachi Saha Sir, and my senior good friend and colleague, Dr. B. Rajkumar Sir. and of course dr virendra goel sir sir you are just lovely you know in coordinating every step till the last step in presenting the seminar thank you very much for all the assistance and i would fail if i do not say uh, dr mr mukesh kumar the deputy secretary of dci he has also given enormous support and thanks to the dci webinar series technical team and i will also like to acknowledge the to few more people just i'll just take another one minute he is dr pd miller who has you know classified the recession of the teeth and is the global sultan of periodontal plastic surgery my mentor and this is dr peter nordland who is the president of the international society of periodontal plastic surgeons where i was inducted as a board member last year and if i am doing anything well today before you all and i'm sharing it is all because of their mentorship that i'm what they are today and another mentor is dr pratip pantumanit this when i finished my phd at tamasat university thailand and he is again a global luminary in the iadr international association of dental research and is a who who consultant for oral health and this is our college and i would invite you all whenever you get a chance and this is the period department where we have uh recently purchased a carl zeiss extaro microscope so all the uh, post graduate residents will be soon doing all the periodontal procedures in this and uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention if you have any questions feel free to email me at this email id and wishing you all again a happy festivity navratri to all of you thank you all thank you very much thank you dr gopala krishnan On uh, behalf of Dental Council of India, I once again thank Dr. Gopala Krishnan for his insight presentation, emphasizing the role of non-surgical periodontal therapy as an efficient treatment modality in the management of periodontal disease.
Now, uh, once again, DCI recognizes the top five dental colleges for the highest participation in the previous webinar. Uh, the colleges who backed up the top positions are St. Joseph Dental College, Iluru, Andhra Pradesh, followed by Sardar Patel Postgraduate Institute of Dental and Medical Sciences, Lucknow, Saraswati Dental College, Lucknow, Vishnu Dental College, Bhimavaram, Andhra Pradesh, and Indraprastha Dental College and Hospital, Ghaziabad. So many congratulations to all the colleges. DCI also appreciate the participation of the other colleges for their continued support and cooperation for the DCI webinar series. Uh, the DCI announces uh, no webinar next week due to the Shara and other festivals coming up, but uh, the next webinar will be held on 1st of November at 1600 hours, that is 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. The webinar will be on the topic, Renaissance Era in Dentistry. So uh, the webinar will be presented by Dr. Shankar Ayer, who is the director, Smile USA Academy of Dental Excellence and a past president, American Academy of Implant Dentistry. The moderator of 16th webinar is uh, Dr. M. Parivel Kumar. He is a secretary and treasurer, Indian Board of Orthodontic Society. So I request all the participants to kindly register for the upcoming webinar, participate in full strength and gain the knowledge for the future professional growth. Uh, for today's session, all the participants are requested to fill the feedback form that uh, they will be receiving via email along with their e-certificates. This can also be downloaded from the webinar section of DCI website. Participants can also view the archived webinar and uh, download their certificates by visiting DCI website, dciindia.gov.in. Uh, I'm also very happy to inform that we have received great attendees participating in the 15th uh, webinar. And uh, so for that, I would like to congratulate the Dental Council of India once again. Um, I once again extend my sincere gratitude to the Honorable President, Dental Council of India, Dr. Debendra Muzunda, sir, Honorable Secretary, Dr. Saha, sir, Executive Committee members, and the Dental Council of India members for bestowing me the honor of moderating this session organized by DCI. My special thanks to Mr. Mukesh, Deputy Secretary, Dental Council of India, Dr. Virendra Goyal, Professor and Head, Pedodontics, Guru Nanak Dev College, Punjab, and the entire technical team of Dental Council of India for rendering all the help in the smooth conduction of this webinar. At the end, I wish all the participants, students, friends, and colleagues a very happy learning through the series of these DCI webinars in the days to come. So with this, I would like to conclude today's webinar. I thank each one of you till we meet the next Wishing you a very happy Navratri and the Shara. Stay safe and healthy. God bless you all. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you. Jai Hind.